London, without a doubt, one of the financial capitals of the world. However, as we have seen last week, there will be now a post-Brexit battle for the City of London. And I think it is very, very likely London will not be able to survive this battle. It has been cut off from a large market of over six, six, what, 600 billion, oh, it's 500 billion people compared to now just a market of 65 billion people. And although many people will say, oh, but Brexit was all about engaging global trade with the world. Well, look what happens when our our bold and fearless international trade maverick, Liz Truss, goes and tries to negotiate treaties and trade deals um, and try and get a slice of the action for the city of London. The Japan deal is a perfect example. Not only did she absolutely fail to guarantee any investor uh, protections or relations, which will basically mean our probably second highest investor in the world comes from Japan, they've had no protections under that trade deal, whereas the, whereas the trade deal that we were in, when we, that we had when we were part of the European Union, did. Uh, you know, these are just, unfortunately, the practical realities of this trade. The idea of that we are somehow this secret trading nation is built on a myths and fantasies about a past Britain that can never really truly exist. And as such, the city of London itself is really living on those myths and realities as well. And the Tories are all about the city of London. But they're about to find out one of our big cash cows in this country of what we get from our GDP does come from London. And that is now going to take a substantial hit post-Brexit. And this is where the battle really truly kicks off. So we, before we dive into the article, uh, please do remember to hit that like and share button. And also down below there's a link to my Patreon page and a one donation link. And thank you very much to all those people who do support me on that. So, this comes from the New European. And the title is, The Post-Brexit Battle That's Only Just Getting Started. Thirty-five years ago, Margaret Thatcher gave us the Big Bang. The deregulation ushered in the golden age of the City of London, bringing in more money, more business, and a wider range of players, and a whole new roster of satirical characters. Harry Enfield's loads of money, Barrow Boys, and of course, Nigel Farage. Now, her disciples are threatening her lucrative legacy. With the rushed, bare-bones trade deal with the European Union, and nothing yet for Britain's all-important financial services. Have the Brexit Tories completely shattered the city? As the UK left the EU's embrace on the December the 31st, the media was awash with the ap apocalyptic headlines of the city being hung out to dry and thrown to the lions. Again, you may remember that uh, very well, and like I say, these financial services are hugely important for our country. Remember, we are an 80% services country. And remember, this bare bones deal has almost nothing to do with services, and financial services make up a large portion of that. So, the Thatcherite Chancellor, Ricky Sunak, promised the Big Bang 2.0, all of his own, following the, quote, Brexit liberation. But so far, the bang seems to be all on the other side. On the 4th of January, the first business day after the transition, uh, after the transition period ended, uh, 6.3 billion euros in stock, in daily stock trades, moved to the EU locations. Platforms dealing with European stocks, <coughs> such as uh, Kobe Europe and Aquis Exchange PLC, are among those moving locations to such as Paris and Amsterdam, reversing a trend that began in the 1980s, when London became an unstoppable centre for equities trading. It's an embarrassment when you're trying to say to the public what a great thing this is, 
and the very first thing you do is lose almost 100% of the city's trading in European equality, inequities. Aqua's chief executive, uh, Astrid Haynes, told me the financial services has a trade surplus of over 60 billion in the United Kingdom. That should have been part of the trade deal. It absolutely should have been part of the trade deal, but as we said at the time, the Tories were so, so desperate to get Brexit done, to try and get their, um, you know, Boris Johnson's oven-ready deal out of, out of the, out of the, you know, out of the oven and into the world, that it was completely dead on arrival. And as we've said before, Boris will have to go back to the EU to try and renegotiate something. But that ain't going to happen. We've already seen the EU saying we're not going to renegotiate the Irish protocol with you because, as Boris and co said, this was perfect. Even the Europeans say this is the, this is the solution. It is either you put the border in the Irish Sea and keep Northern Ireland in the customs union or the, island, the border gets moved on to the, between the Republic and the north of Ireland. That, again, will both bring huge troubles. One will bring international condemnation, which we do not want. <laughs> so, the so-called jobs brexitus has been going on for a while now. The consultancy company EY said at the end of last year, there are already 7,500 jobs and approximately £1.2 trillion have moved to Europe as a result of Brexit. And this might be only the beginning. Estimates for the medium-term job moves range from about 35,000 upwards. And according to JP Morgan's boss in France, there was virtually nil chance of moving everyone, uh, every one banking job from London to Paris before the 2016 referendum. When Boris Johnson said, perhaps uh, we didn't quite get as much as we uh, would have hoped on financial services, it was an under, under, underestimate of, e of epic proportions. It is what he meant by when he said F business. Financial services in the UK employ more than a million people and account for around 7% of the economy and over a tenth of the country's tax revenue. It is extraordinary to see an important sector that feels, uh, that feels solid after a Brexit championed by a supposed economic libertarians. The financial services industry is 200 times the size of fishing, which at least had its day in the limelight. With the bankers uninvolved since at least the 2008 global crisis, and anyway, a bunch of Ramonas, maybe they were always unlikely to be granted much love by the government. Maybe ministers felt the city big boys would be able to cope. In any case, once you decide to leave the single market and end freedom of movement for people, as Theresa May announced in 2016, there's even the scant possibility of, effective, of, a, of, a, of an effective financial services deal. But this does seem like a bit of its own goal just at the same time, especially given the hit the economy is going through due to the pandemic. So far, the moves have been largely related to trade in European shares, which the EU say must be conducted within the bloc. And by a number of jobs moving, EU moving is dwarfed by those still in place. The EU share trading in the UK produced about three billion pounds of tax last year. By comparison, the square mile as a whole generated around £65 billion in tax in 2019, according to the City of London Corporation. The issue is not so much what has gone, damaging as it is, but the uncertainty that remains. The UK and the EU will not produce a memorandum of understanding on financial services until at least next month. London has lost its passporting rights rights, which allowed banks and trading platforms to offer financial services across the EU. So, the future relationship will be complicated and piecemeal, based on frameworks for third countries such as the US. The EU is determined that those leaving the bloc can't cherry-pick the best bits and is playing tough. France, now the largest capital market in the EU, leads countries 
wanted to grab a bigger slice of the city's asset management businesses. And thanks to painstaking extensive preparation, bankers and asset managers were not disrupted in the first, in the first days of full Brexit, but wait nervously as the EU considers tighter rules in areas including deregulation of fund management. This could, lead, this could restrict hedge funds being managed from the location outside the EU, such as London, and potentially even affect the entire industry, including US giant BlackRock. In Brussels, Marcus Fugger, the senior MEP, said late last January that the question of whether to tighten deregulation rules depends on how far the UK departs from EU standards. A worrying Bloomberg report cites dozens of officials at global institutions and warns of the initial exodus of traders and salespeople could be followed by a wave of high-flying dealmakers who advise on strategies, mergers and raising capital. Brussels has also laid claim to the euro-based uh, 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 derivatives on the ground of financial stability. Some of these have even gone to the United States, which currently has more access to the EU than us. This risks trillions of pounds in existing UK trade. They're going to look at clearing, at, at, at deregulatives and at trading, and I think if they succeed at that, then London has a real problem, Haynes says. London needs to fight back, he said, and creating an attractive environment for entrepreneurs with careful incentives on tax, subsidies and government support, and lure increasingly powerful non-professional investors too. If Europe can capitalise on London's woes, it absolutely will. EU capitals have long been uh, the uh, uh, covetous of the UK's financial primacy and the pressure on banks to move to the continent is now very strong. And at the release of the European Commission paper on promoting global trade of the euro, Fubar urged a master plan that helps keep the key financial sector businesses moving from the United Kingdom to the European Union. The holy grail for the UK financial services would be for the, e for the EU to grant equivalents, which means it gives market access to banks, insurances and other financial firms, if each side recognises the other's regulations as equally strict. The UK preemptively offered equivalence to the EU, but apart from the time-limited equivalence in two areas, clearing and settlement, the EU has not reciprocated. The financial equivalence would help both sides, but it's politically tricky. The recent vaccine row now, uh, and now the fractious Brexit talks hardly incentivised Brussels to give London something entirety in as it is and as it would be a gift to them. The value of, equival of equivalence depends on the strings attached, and the Bank of England Governor Andrew Baisley said that it would be problematic to sign up to it if it meant Brussels could dictate standards to the UK. Being able to set its own rules is, a crucial, uh, is crucial to London being able to attract new business. And a new financial think tank report maintains that December's deal leaves the UK in a worse shape than Australia. The government uh, euphemism of a no deal which has equivalents in 19 areas. Canada has 20 and the US has 23. Even so, its founder, William Wright, isn't, pe isn't preaching uh, pessimism. Brexit dents, but does not fatally undermine many factors that have helped make London a dominant financial centre, Wright said. The, U sh the, the UK should cut its losses, diverge selectively on on regulations and help develop trade in financial sectors and closer partnerships with markets in the US, Switzerland and Asia. The UK has an opportunity to imperativize a recalitive and reignitive its own markets and will have to work hard in the coming years to avoid structural damage to the city's international position. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. I've said the Tories are very stuck in their ways and like I say, big thinking like that isn't their thing. One early decision for the City of London was to reinstate trading in Swiss shares. An EU ban on trade talks route back in 2019 lost the UK some 1.3 billion euros a day. Much else is vague, however. Stock marking listing, listing rules could be relaxed and Sunak has suggested reforms designed to take a larger chunk of the growing green finance and fintech sectors. London still has several advantages as an, as, as an important global capital market, including language, lawyers, history and a skilled workforce 
concentrated around a definable hub, with cities such as Paris, Frankfurt, Milan, Madrid and Amsterdam vying for business, the EU has no single attractive point. Yet, focusing on squabbling between London and the EU ignores what both stand to lose. Without the UK, the EU is no longer the world's second largest capital market and will miss the financial experience of the UK. The UK relinquishes its, out, uh, its, its, over, uh, its outsized influence on the, UK, on the EU and risks its own role as a gateway to EU markets. They need to work together. Business loss to the US or Asian markets makes both jurisdictions look bad. So what if the gamble doesn't pay off? Paul Myers, a former city minister, has predicted a profound change to the city over the next 10 years as a result of the UK's dismissive negotiating strategy, invoking a gradual dismissal of funds and importance. And whether, and one of, and one of it, however, of loads of money then. Or, for more uh, current example, could the uh, oversexed, overworked rookies in the BBC's, uh, BBC's industrial be swapping their city flats for Persian apartments and a taste of a uh, and a taste for uh, French champagne. Uh, again, it's uh, all up in the air, and this again was predicted, and we have seen such things take place. Now, I'm a, a bit of a pessimist when it comes to this because, as I say, with the Tories in charge, I do not think they can think big enough to really solve these problems, and I think what Ricky Sunak is proposing. Again, it ain't going to help, especially with the EU now on the march to say, OK, we've lost all that experience from London, but there's Paris, Madrid, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, all these other very good financial sectors where we can now do business. And if the EU really do decide to take a hard line against um, you know, financial services being... Uh, the, the funds being outside of the EU, which historically so far they have taken a dim view against, so there is no, um, so it isn't likely that they're not going to continue that trend, uh, then they will do that. And like I say, remember how uh, Jacob Rees Mogg moved his, uh, he moved his uh, finances out over to Dublin to protect against any Brexit regulations. With those funds now back in place, that could mean all of Jacob Rees-Mogg's investments, either A, has to move it back to the UK, which will involve its own damage in some way, or he will have to completely divest all his current holdings in the UK and transfer them all over to stuff in Europe, which, for a Brexiteer, would be incredibly embarrassing. It's already embarrassing by the fact that he's had to move his... Um, entire fund out over to Dublin. And again, that hasn't moved back since Brexit. So, once again, this is something that we are going to have to keep an eye on and just see how this situation really evolves over time. That's unfortunately the only thing we've got to say, but the damage to the City of London that, that, that Brexit has done will be significant and will lose a lot of tax revenue. And, of course, a lot of the Tory friends in the City of London will not be happy of what the Tories have done. So, as always, uh, please do remember to hit that like and share button on your way out. And of course, down below there's a link to my Patreon page and a one-up donation link. And as always, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you all next time.